I first discovered the Panama match stamps when I started collecting canals a few years ago and um, I was really fascinated by all of the different overprints on those early canal zone issues and I decided that if I wanted to fully understand those stamps it made sense to go back to the source and, and learn more about the original Panama stamps so um, that's, that's what I decided to do and I discovered that these stamps have a very interesting story to tell and the details of why they were issued in the first place as well as the significance of all of the different overprints uh, that were applied over roughly a 20 year period um, it really provides a, a fascinating window into what was a particularly exciting and eventful period in the history of Panama um, and the US also played a major role and uh, so that, that's going to be the focus of this presentation and um, I, I should also just mention up front for those Canal Zone fans out there that um, most of my presentation is actually going to focus on the period before the Canal Zone Postal Service began operations. Um, I do have some interesting material from the very first Canal Zone issue uh, but I'm not going to spend too much time talking about the subsequent issues tonight. There's uh, frankly a lot of ground to cover just up to that first issue and there really isn't enough time to uh, go too far into the rest of those issues and the kind of detail they deserve. So um, that's going to be the focus and uh, we're going to start by just walking uh, fairly quickly through the different stamp issues and then we'll finish up uh, looking at a few interesting covers. So um, if we're going to talk about map stamps, um, it makes sense that we start with a map, I think. Uh, this, this is a modern map that you see on this slide, but it shows what I want to show. Um, some of you I know have probably traveled to Panama and know this stuff already, but for those of you who haven't, which includes me, uh, the country is bordered by Costa Rica to the left and Colombia to the, uh, I'm sorry, Col Costa Rica to the west and Colombia to the east. And, um, you know, really, if ever a country's destiny was shaped by its geography, I think that would have to be Panama, which sits right there at the narrowest point between the two great oceans. And when our story starts, Panama was still a part of Colombia and there was no Panama Canal. Um, so before we move on I just want to point out some of the town names on the map which are going to figure into our story. Uh, you can see in the center of the map in, in capital letters the city of Panama which is on the Pacific side and a little northwest of that on the uh, Caribbean Sea, which is the Atlantic side, you see Colón. Um, those two locations have both long been important ports and trading centers, providing a gateway from the Spanish to transport silver from Peru back to Spain in the 16th and 17th centuries, and more recently playing an important role in the movement of mail and passengers between the oceans. Since 1855, they were the terminals of the Panama Railroad and they would eventually also become the terminals for the canal. And again, um, on the Atlantic side, right next door to Colón is Cristobal, which had first been built by the Panama Railroad Company in the 1850s as their headquarters. And later that was uh, significantly expanded to become uh, really the nerve center for the whole canal zone operation, not just the headquarters location, but also the port of entry for construction equipment and materials, as well as canal workers and all their supplies and provisions. Uh, the other place I just want to point out on the map is uh, Bocas del Toro, uh, which is over towards the border with Costa Rica. Um, about 180 miles or so away from Panama City as the crow flies. So talking of the canal, the first Panama map stamps were issued in 1887 and 1888, which happens to be around the same time that this bond was issued, 
um, you may be able to see roughly in the center of the bond above the signatures, um, it, there's a date there, it says Paris, June 26th, 1888. And, um, I found this bond at a stamp show a couple of years ago, and I have to tell you, I was really excited when I found this. I just started seriously collecting Panama material fairly recently, and I figured this had to be a great piece to add to my collection. You know, a French Panama Canal bond, you know, pretty special. I, I'm probably never going to see one of these again, right? You know, I've got to buy this. So I did, and uh, when I got home, I did a little research on eBay to check out this, this great bog, and I just picked up, only to discover that I could have probably actually bought at least three different Panama Canal bonds and spent a lot less than what I just paid for this one. Um, turns out these are not that rare at all, in fact, because um, so many of them were issued. There was just tremendous enthusiasm in France for the whole Panama Canal project and the seemingly insatiable appetite among the investing public to get in on the action here. So, you know, after all, Ferdinand de Lesseps, um, was the guy who just had such a tremendous success building the Suez Canal, you know, he was the toast of France. Um, naturally, he was going to be just as successful building a canal across Panama, right? Well, not quite. That's not exactly how it worked out. By, by 1888, when this bond uh, was issued, the French had already been working on digging their canal in Panama for about six years. And uh, that effort would come to a fairly ignominious end less than a year after this bond was successfully issued due to a um, whole combination of factors, mismanagement, um, devastating disease, financial problems, um, engineering mistakes. Um, th this one is actually from the eighth of a total of nine different bond issues um, of the French Panama Canal Company, all issued between 1880 and 1889. And uh, the company would, uh, would go bankrupt the following year, um, almost dragging the whole French economy down with it. So if investors in France in the middle of 1888 were still firm believers in the canal project, probably the powers that be in Colombia a year earlier when these stamps were issued, uh, were also still convinced that the project was on track. These were the first stamps designed around a map of Panama. And uh, I, I like to think that they're also the first stamps to depict the Panama Canal. You can perhaps see on the stamps that they, there is actually a clearly visible line drawn on the map on each stamp between Panama City and Colón. And, um, you know, maybe that's the Camino Real, which was the Spanish Silver Trail. Maybe it's the railroad. Um, I think more than likely it's the canal. You know, think of it as, as one of those artist's impressions coming soon to your neighborhood, a big ditch. So in 1887, Panama was just one of several departments of Colombia and was already using regular Colombian stamps. So, so why were these stamps issued at all? Uh, what happened was that following a civil war in 1885, Colombia had officially uh, moved to adopt a paper currency, but Panama uh, which always op operated a little bit independently, continued to use silver currency, which had a significantly higher purchasing power than the new Colombian paper. So it was actually possible to buy the regular Colombian stamps with paper money and then sell them for silver in Panama and make a significant profit. And in, in July of 1887, when the postal agent in Panama brought this to the attention of the central government in Bogota. Um, they quickly issued this new set of stamps which were intended to be used only in Panama and they uh, prohibited any further use of the regular Colombian stamps there. 
th this is the complete series of six values that were issued and um, the first thing to notice about these is that each denomination was actually printed on a different colored paper uh, which seems perhaps a little unusual but um, was actually the norm for Colombian stamp issues around that time. By the late 1800s, most South American countries were having their stamps printed in the US, um, often by the American banknote company. Uh, Colombia was the exception in continuing to print its stamps locally. However, until the early 1900s, there was uh, no rail network that connected Bogota with the coastal ports of Colombia, which were hundreds of miles away. So transportation to and from the capital city was, was a significant challenge and commodities such as paper were always in short supply. So the, the Colombian stamps of this period tended to be printed on all sorts of uh, different types of paper of various qualities and colors. And, and this particular issue was designed and printed on particularly short notice. So for that reason, the use of the different colored papers for each value was, I think, determined um, less for aesthetic reasons than by whatever paper the printer had to have on hand at the time, frankly. And uh, for the same reason, some of these stamps were initially issued in sheets of 100 some were issued in sheets of 90, depending on, on what size of uh, paper sheets were available. The, um, the 10 centavos stamp on yellow paper was the first stamp to be issued and distributed. Uh, the other denominations followed over the next several months. There were actually multiple printings of all of these stamps over the next three or four years and the paper colors generally changed a little bit from one printing to another and there were also dye flaws that uh, became progressively more visible with each successive printing and just to further complicate matters towards the end of the issued life of this first series somebody working apparently in the Panama postal system decided to do uh, someone a favor and also probably no doubt earn a few bucks on the side and arranged for the printing of quantities of additional stamps using the same lithographic stones as the originals and, and mostly similar colors. Those favor items uh, by now have been pretty well documented and are quite easy to recognize but um, what with those, and the, there were also some outright counterfeits that were produced at a later date. So um, even though none of these stamps is especially valuable, um, collecting this issue can, can become an interesting challenge. After a few years and a few different printings, the Bogota issue was replaced by a new set of stamps, uh, which this time um, was printed by the American Banknote Company in, in New York City and again picturing a, um, the map of Panama but with a slightly different design and these are the stamps that would be used in Panama up, up until uh, November of 1903. The three higher values of the series, um, that's the 20 cents and, and above, were not actually issued until um, 1895-96 time frame because they still actually had adequate supply of the first issue on hand. And um, in fact in 1894 they'd made use of some of that remaining stock to alleviate a temporary shortage of some of the lower denominations. So. The, uh, in the second row there, these surcharge stamps of the 1894 provisional issue, uh, these became the first of the many different overprints that we're going to follow in the in years to come. Um, just want to point out that the, uh, the second and third stamps there, the ones with the red overprints, are both from the earlier Bogota series, um, so you can perhaps see a little more, more clearly the design differences between the, uh, the two primary series of map stamps here. Very different framing and obviously redrawn maps, but um, both still showing the canal. 
So, and I'm just showing one example of each of the three revalued stamps, but um, I should stress that even with this first set of overprints, there are multiple collectible varieties of each of these caused by different type setting of the surcharges, dropped or broken letters, inversions, double printings, etc., etc. All of those would be a common element of virtually all of the subsequent overprints, and certainly one reason why um, all of these map stamps have attracted so much collector interest over the years. The events leading up to the US finally deciding to support the building of a canal in Panama rather than Nicaragua, as well as the subsequent breakdown of negotiations with Colombia and the various diplomatic behind the scenes goings on that eventually led the US uh, to support an independent Panama uh, make for a very fascinating story which I am not planning to rehash for you tonight. Uh, but suffice to say that Panama declared its independence from Colombia on November 3rd of 1903. Within days of the revolution, the postal authorities in Panama arranged for the provisional overprinting of quantities of the 1892 issue stamps for use in the New Republic. The overprinting was done in, in three different locations. Uh, Panama, Colón, and Bocas del Toro. And you can see that each of these post, office, post offices put together its own uh, very different rubber stamps to meet this need. Um, some of them came out better than others, but um, they served their purpose. And generally, uh, these were only on sale for just a few weeks. In Cologne, in December, um, they actually switched to a brass hand stamp just reading Panama. And um, these also didn't come out too well. Um, finally, in January, in, in Cologne, they managed to do a much more successful printed surcharge. Uh, this time also including a horizontal bar, which was intended to cross out Colombia at the top of each stamp. And uh, if you notice, they even used four different colors for the different values. Something else of note here is that both of the 50 centavo stamps um, in the second and third colon issues are actually from the earlier uh, Bogota series stamps. Uh, for some reason, the Colon post office received only very limited supplies with the 50 cent American banknote stamp, so most of the ones used in Cologne at this time were from that earlier issue. Next slide, please. In Panama City, uh, they were also very busy in December. The first row of stamps, which is the, um, the second Panama issue, uh, these were issued very early in December, probably around December the 3rd, we think. Um, with a printed surcharge and a horizontal bar. Uh, they used either carmine or black Panama overprints and then a horizontal bar which was in the same color as the stamp. Fairly quickly somebody realized that having to have two different colored overprints on each stamp uh, was going to be way too complicated. So later in December they moved to an all carmine overprint and added some additional values for the third issue. And the fourth issue, which followed fairly quickly, used a similar format and is identifiable mostly by the relative means of the overprints. The actual issue dates of all these three issues is a little difficult to pin down, but there are a couple of known examples of the 10 cent value from the fourth issue, which are dated as early as December 28th, which is believed to be the first day for that stamp. Some of the other values were probably not issued until the early months of 1904. Uh, just a few observations on these stamps before we move forward. Um, obviously, the second issue is easy enough to identify because of the different colored bar. Um, differentiate 
differentiating between the third and fourth issues is much less straightforward. The stamps illustrated here show the two Panamas both reading up from the, uh, for the third issue and then reading up and down for the fourth issue and, and this was the way these were supposed to look. But in, in fact for both issues you'll come across examples that have both Panamas reading up or down as well as up and down examples for the third issue. So. Um, it can get a little confusing. There is actually um, a difference in the um, the size of the, of the printing for the from those two issues. So there are ways to tell them apart. It can be a little confusing. Um, the other um, thing I just wanted to point out on on these issues is that whoever thought up uh, the design for these also overlooked the fact that. Um, to print Panama this way twice on every stamp on a sheet of 100 stamps would require uh, 600 capital A's of the same font, which was something that at that time no printing office in Panama could supply. So they managed to alleviate this problem to some extent by printing a half sheet at a time, which that of course created its own additional problems. Um, but these overprints are, are notable for featuring a uh, frankly weird and wonderful collection of different fonts, sometimes even on the same stamps, as well as inverted these used instead of A's. Um, these third and fourth issue stamps were intended to replace all of the other provisional, provisional issues throughout Panama. And my sense is that they were being pretty widely used fairly early in 1904. Uh, these stamps also, of course, became the primary source material for the subsequent canal zone issues, uh, which we'll touch on in a moment. Uh, there were multiple printings of the fourth series stamps, and uh, these issues also remained the primary stamps in use in Panama for most of the next three years. In August of 1904, Panama had announced uh, what would become the first truly new stamp issue of the Republic, as opposed to all the overprints that they've been using so far. These once again were printed by American banknotes, but um, in the event they were not actually in fact issued in Panama until February of 1905. The map designs here are pretty much identical to those printed earlier for Colombia, but the framing is quite different. And uh, these also have the November 3rd, 1903 date of Panama's independence printed in a uh, narrow band above the map. Given that these stamps were apparently delivered to Panama in time to be released on the one year anniversary of the revolution, and um, you know, frankly, I would have thought that their issue might have been somewhat of a big deal being the first new stamps to be issued by the Republic. It's kind of odd that not only were they not issued in Panama until the following February, but also over 70% of this issue was actually sold off to the Canal Zone Postal Service, which overprinted and issued these stamps first um, in December of 1904. In, uh, in 1906, Panama commissioned a whole new set of stamps from the Hamilton Banknote Company with brand new designs, mostly featuring notable figures from Panama's past that these would not be delivered until much later in the year. In the meantime, they continued to overprint and use up stamps from the fourth issue. And there was even this one final set of provisional surcharges issued in 1906, when once again, they revalued some of the excess inventory of, of higher value stamps. Um, after so many different overprinted issues, you'd think they might have mastered the art by this time, but probably the main distinction of this final series of Panama overprints is, is how messy the overprints are, frankly. I did try to pick out some nicer looking examples, but uh, some of these can get pretty ugly. Yeah. 
after declaring its independence from Colombia on November 3rd, Panama signed a treaty on November 18th, 1903, that created and gave the U.S. a perpetual lease on the Canal Zone. Until George Davis, who was the first governor of the Canal Zone, arrived on the scene in the middle of May 1904, I don't think anyone had given too much thought to the need for a postal system in this new U.S. territory. But once on the scene, he moved quickly to establish the Canal Zone Postal Service and also put in a request to Washington for a supply of U.S. stamps, proposing that they be overprinted with the words Canal Zone. Because these U.S. stamps did not arrive soon enough, Davis arranged as a temporary measure to buy a small supply of the fourth issue Panama stamps from the Panama government and he requested that these be hand stamped canal zone on top of the existing overprints and these became the initial three stamp series of canal zone stamps issued on June 24th 1904. The overprinted second Bureau series stamps uh, finally arrived from the U.S. a couple of weeks later and once those went on sale on July 18th this hand stamped first issue was withdrawn from sale and the unsold stamps were destroyed. The overprinted U.S. stamps continued to be sold and used in the Canal Zone until December the 11th. Uh, during those early months, the operation of the postal service in the zone was just one of a number of irritants that arose between the governments of Panama and the U.S. President Roosevelt sent his Secretary of War, William Taft, uh, down to Panama to arbitrate the various disagreements, and one of the results of what became known as the Taft Agreement was a stipulation that U.S. stamps would not be used in the Canal Zone. So they went back to sourcing stamps from Panama. Mostly these were stamps from the third and fourth issues, and this time the additional printing of the Canal Zone overprints was done in the Canal Zone. As, as I noted earlier, to keep this presentation within reasonable bounds, I'm not going to spend too much time on these other canal zone issues which uh, are a fascinating and complex area to study in their own right. I just want to highlight on this page uh, the two stamps at the left in the second row. Uh, these are the new uh, date of independence stamps issued here with the canal zone overprint two months before the originals went on sale in Panama. And, um, a, a variety of different canal zone overprints on map stamps continue to be used through the end of 1906. So that's a story for another, another day. Um, so let's look at some covers. If we, th this is currently my only example featuring stamps from the uh, August Art issue. Most surviving covers from this issue uh, were sent to foreign addresses. So the lower denomination stamps are uh, particularly rare on cover for this issue. Um, Columbia had joined the UPU in 1881 and uh, 10 centavos uh, was the correct rate for a single weight foreign letter during this period. So uh, the 10 centavos stamps are relatively less rare on, on cover than, than the other values. Uh, this one must have been a double weight letter and uh, the double franking is actually quite scarce. I believe this is one of only two or three recorded examples of the double franking. Um, obviously, it would have been nice if the Panama had stamp had been a little clearer on this, but uh, this was mailed in Panama City on August 15th, 1891. Um, it would have initially traveled across the isthmus via the Panama Railroad to Cologne, and from there by steamship to New York. Uh, there's an August 24th New York foreign transit stamp on the reverse. Um, you can see, I think, on, on, on the front here, a uh, French railway stamp, um, Calais to Paris, dated uh, September 2nd. 
And uh, finally, on the reverse, there's a September 3rd arrival stamp in Maury. So moving on to the uh, American banknote issue. Um, once again, I have to say with this issue, the foreign usages tend to be a little easier to find. Uh, the first cover with the green one cent hour stamp is a postcard uh, mailed from Panama to Graz, Austria on uh, January 4th, 1900. Uh, an interesting double franking with the five heller Austrian stamp. The postcard rate from Panama to Austria was two centavos, so this was definitely on the pay, just the one centavo stamp. Um, I believe five heller would have been the correct Austrian postcard rate, so that would have covered the postage due. But uh, this is a, it's a regular issue Austrian stamp, not a postage due stamp, and it's also cancelled in Vienna. Uh, not in Graz, so I'm, I'm kind of puzzled to pay for that step. Uh, the other markets here also don't provide too many clues to clarify the routing for this part. The octagonal marking in the top centre, um, I believe, is an Austrian marking, but unfortunately not, not too much. So a, a little bit of mystery attached to that. One. The, um, the two centavo stamp. Um, was designed to play postcard rate, but here we have the vertical strip of five which was used to pay the foreign lighter rate on the registered cover to Germany. This was mailed March 27th of 1900. The registration fee was paid with the 10 centavos registry label, and just note that that is a, it says Columbia at the top, but it says Panama on the um, on the left side of that registry label. So that is a, a Panama registry label. Um, and there's also a nice uh, New York Register Exchange label, which you can see there. And according to the back stamps, this one passed through the New York Registry Division on April 6th and arrived in Hamburg April 16th. So still with the uh, American banknote issue. Um, Ten cents, um, as we noted, was still the correct UP foreign letter rate through the 1890s. Uh, these two covers actually make an interesting pair because they illustrate the two very different routings that were on offer for mail from Panama to Europe during this period. Both of these also originated in Panama City, so they would have begun their journeys with a train trip to Colón. Um, the first cover was mailed from Panama December 1, 1892, um, travelled to Paris, not via New York this time, but by French packet boats. Um, these had been sailing out of Colón regularly since about 1865, and at this time there were two different routes in operation, each with one monthly voyage. The octagonal marking uh, that you see there, uh, Colonus and Nazaire, tells us that this, this one travelled on, on what was known as Line A, which always sailed from Colon in the uh, early part of the month, making stops in uh, Colombia, Venezuela, Martinique and Guadeloupe before heading over to San Nazaire in France. Uh, the other packet boat, uh, routing, which was known as Line D, uh, generally left uh, towards the end of each month, making stops in uh, Cuba, Haiti, Puerto Rico and St. Thomas, and then south to Bordeaux, rather than San Nazar. Anyway, this cover um, arrived in Paris December 24th, so the uh, journey from Panama to Paris this time took 23 days versus 18 days for the earlier of assembly in New York. The second cover, um, another registered letter, this time addressed to Switzerland, was actually marked by the sender to be sent via New York, which um, I suspect was probably the norm for registered items. Um, interestingly, the, the registration fee here was paid with the Tensitavos Colombian registration label. Um, I, I pointed out the Panama label on the previous slide. This one is just 
the Columbia label. Um, they seem to have been used interchangeably at, at this time. Um, this was mailed from Panama January 27, 1899, uh, passed through the New York Register Division on February the 13th. Um, no indication, unfortunately, when it reached Zurich. And um, I, I'm not too good with manuscript markings, but in addition to uh, what looks like a blue, blue numeral six in the center of this cover, there appears to be a, um, a red six partially covered by the registry exchange label. So if anybody can interpret what those markings might mean, uh, please let me know. So just one final example from this 1892 issue, this time uh, the consulate got a mail to the US. Uh, the UPU letter rate had increased to 20 centavos in 1903, and uh, this one I particularly like uh, because it was mailed on November the 2nd, which was actually the day before the revolution, and uh, arrived in, in the States a week later. Unfortunately, again, another thing postmark. Uh, unfortunately, the first thing that hits your eye on these is that ugly orange splotch in the middle of each of those colours, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But uh, if, if you can look beyond that, uh, these are quite interesting covers, both using stamps from the first Panama issue right after the revolution. Now, if you believe the Scots catalogue, the first day of issue for these would be November 16th, which would make the top one a first day cover. Um, in fact, the uh, first day of issue for these was actually November the 9th. But um, this is still an early usage, and uh, multiples of this issue on cover are, are definitely not common. These are both from a collection of covers I was lucky enough to stumble into a couple of years ago. All US consular covers mailed from Panama to New York in uh, the few months between independence in November of 1903 and the establishment of the Canal Zone Postal Service uh, the following June. Another interesting question related to both of these covers is, is you know, what was the correct postal rent during this period? Columbia, um, as I mentioned, was, had been a UPU member since 1881. The Republic of Panama would become a UPU member in January of 1905. Uh, but actually, Panama didn't publish its own post red schedule until July of 1904. So, um, to some extent, these covers were all mailed, I guess, in uh, no man's land as far as personal race were concerned. Um, the cover on the previous slide, while well, well, Panama was part of Colombia, correctly paid the 20 centavos um, UPU rate in 1903, but of course by November that year, um, Panama was no longer a part of Colombia, um, although the whole world had not yet recognized that fact. Um, Colombia would not recognize that fact until, I think, 1909. Anyway, uh, all of these consumer covers are oversized envelopes, presumably being used to mail copies of consular invoices and other official documents. So I'm assuming that double, triple rates, etc., would have been quite common. All of the other covers I found in this uh, consular cash were franked between 20 and 60 centavos. So this first one. Um, stands out a little bit with a one, one twenty cent hours, frankly. Um, either it was a very busy week at the U.S. consulate, which it probably would have been, I suspect, um, or else no mechanic to do what the correct postage rate, rate should be, and was just being extra careful to make sure they had enough stamps on this one. Okay, so these are the other sides of the orange species. Um, the, the blotches were, co were caused by the wax consular seals uh, on the reverse of, of these envelopes. And um, happily, um, you know, the, okay, we've got to live with the orange blotches, but um, I'll live with those because the seals survived virtually intact. 
and uh, I think these have considerable interest to the historical background here. The, uh, the seal from the first envelope, although mailed after the US recognized Panama as an independent republic, still reads Panama, Colombia. Uh, by the time of the second cover, which was mailed just a few weeks later in early January 1904, the U.S. had officially re-established its diplomatic presence there and had also updated its consular seal to read Republic of Panama. This is another cover mail a little later in January and uh, this one gives a nice comparison on the same piece of, of two different um, issues. The, the one stamp at the lower left of the block is from the second issue, uh, which you can see from the uh, black Panama overprint and the orange bar. Uh, the other uh, block of three, the other stamps um, are overprinted in red. Um, so that block is from the fourth issue. So two covers now from Cologne, and I have to say that the uh, person who works in Cologne uh, generally did a much nicer job with their hand stamps than the folks in Panama City seem to do. We've got two nice councils here that uh, you can actually read. Um, on the top cover, we've got a pair of the third Cologne provisionals. Uh, those stamps have been issued just a few days before this cover was mailed on January the 12th of 1904. And that particular uh, duplex hand stamp has been in use in Cologne since 1902, so obviously before the revolution. Uh, the second cover features a pair of stamps from the fourth Panama issue, which by April was now obviously being used uh, not just in Panama, but in, in Cologne as well. And uh, this one also has a, uh, a beautiful strike of a cancel featuring the new flag of the Panama Republic. Uh, the earliest recorded use of that council was just a couple of weeks before this cover was mailed, and, and that flag design uh, council was only ever used in Colorado. So, so we're going to finish up with uh, just a few covers from the Canal Zone first issue. Um, and as I noted earlier, these stamps were only in use for a total of 24 days, and uh, these two covers um, sort of put in that period a little bit. Uh, both were mailed from Bristol, which was about to become the most important town in the Canal Zone, at least for the duration of the canal construction period. And uh, Christabel actually became the longest continuously operating post office in the zone. Uh, unfortunately, once again, the circular date stamps on both these covers are too faint to show up on the scans, but um, believe me, both our council were the first Christabel CDS, which I've illustrated what that looks like in the center of the slide. Uh, based on the typical sailing time to New York, the cover address to London was probably mailed um, either June 28th or 29th. The cover to Cologne, which uh, was right next to the Christabel, was mailed on July 13th. Unlike the earlier Panama covers we've seen so far, um, foreign destination covers, certainly European destination covers for this issue, are, um, are actually quite rare. So I know this London cover uh, is definitely a little ratty, to say the least, but I'm, I'm very happy to have it anyway. Um, Jim Hines, the addressee on the second cover, was the US Vice Consul in Cologne at that time. Most of the surviving covers from this uh, first canal zone issue, uh, frankly, a philatelic rather than commercial, but um, I think very interesting nonetheless. I'm going to finish it with these two items, both self-addressed by one um, who will be practicing this, Apollonari Bienkowski. Uh, Mr. B was born in Poland, um, he emigrated to the U.S. in the 1880s and came to Panama around 1902, uh, where he became a news dealer, establishing the Panama Railroad News Agency. 
So as part of this business, we operate in Houston's uh, various railroad stations um, on, on the Panama Railroad, uh, many of which in 94 became the first branch post offices of the Canal Zone Postal Service. And it seems that he made a point of mainly covers from this, this first issue to himself from several, possibly all, of the newly established post offices along the route of the railroad. Um, these are two of them, um, another least um, six known to exist. It's possible that there are more out there. Um, these actually are two of the scarcest postmarks from this period. The first envelope was mailed from Bobillo, which was the site of the settlement started originally in the 1850s when the railroad was under construction. It became um, a few years later a district headquarters for, for the French canal building effort. So by the time the US took over, it was already a sizable town there. And um, although the early US plans contemplated building a dam in the uh, when, when, when the location of the dam was, was eventually moved to Gaton, uh, but I, or he was there, he's a remember that. Yes, the post office there operated for less than eight years, and the town of Bobillo uh, now rests under the waters of Gaton Lake. Um, the second cover, um, Empire, was actually the largest town. Uh, between Colón and Panama City when the U.S. took over, and it remained a very busy centre of activity throughout the development of the years, after which its importance quickly declined. Um, Empire was, the, the town of Empire was abandoned, and the post office closed there in 1921. Um, in, in the centre of this slide, I copied a manuscript annotation from the back of the white book, which reads, Guaranteed Jesse Perry. Uh, there's a sim similar marking on the back of the blue cover. James Perry was another interesting personality from the early days of the Canal Zone. He had a long and distinguished career in the US Public Health Service, including about 10 years working as the Chief Quarantine Officer in the Canal Zone. Uh, he also was a stamp collector and until his death in the mid-1930s was generally regarded as the leading expert on this first issue of Canal Zone Stamps. The, 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 I should say that the stamps of this first Canal Zone issue are by a long way the, the most valuable that we've looked at tonight. So not surprisingly there are lots of forgeries of the Canal Zone over the printout there. So, Having, having Mr. Perry's guarantee, guarantee was always considered to be a good thing. His signature or initials can also often be found on the back of individual stamps from this issue. He was clearly someone who was very active, both in buying up these stamps when they were on sale, and also in orchestrating for the mailing of covers on his circle. He became a primary source of supply of these stamps and covers for most of the better known US dealers of that era. Beginning in the 1950s, his activities began to attract a little bit more critical scrutiny as more documentation came to light about his quote uh, cover pushing. So there's probably um, more information to be discovered about these items and uh, my research there is ongoing. And uh, with that, I will thank you all for your attention. And uh, if any of you have any questions, I'll be happy to do my best to try and answer them. I have a question. Mm -hmm. Dave? You mentioned that the first Nelson issue were relatively scarce in the international covers, do you consider it mailed to the U.S. to be international? Yes, I mean, the, uh, the U I would say that covers in the U.S. are not as scarce as covers in Europe, but um, far but by a long way, um, most of the surviving known covers of this issue um, were mailed uh, to either to other within the canal zone or within Panama. Um, 
for what I've done all of them, I think you were with the little In fact, I mean, our friend James Perry, her, her well over, um, I think, 30, 40 covers that um, have this um, handwriting or mail to him or, or whatever. There's, there's several other people who I think are probably in this circle. Um, that uh, you know we're also involved in, in just mailing uh, covers from different different uh, post offices on the zone to, to one another, and uh, those are most of the covers that, that I'm aware of. And um, uh, you know I've not seen a lot of international covers of these at all, frankly.